So today we're talking uh, again about more congenital atrioventricular valve abnormalities. In particular today, we're talking about stenosis and regurgitation of the atrioventricular valves. Congenital mitral stenosis is the first topic that we'll discuss. And <clears throat> by history, many of these patients are symptomatic from early infancy. Uh, they often have tachypnea, poor feeding, failure to thrive because of uh, elevated left atrial pressure, elevated pulmonary venous pressure, and the, the heart failure that goes along with that. Uh, alternatively, <clears throat> some forms of mitral stenosis present later uh, the mitral valve simply uh, doesn't, either doesn't grow normally or becomes less functional with time so that as patients grow and their cardiac output increases, uh, they develop symptoms uh, of dyspnea, particularly dyspnea with exertion in older patients, limited exercise capacity. These are some of the manifestations. Typically, the right ventricular impulse is increased because uh, there's often pulmonary hypertension uh, because of reflected pressure retrograde from the high left atrial pressure. The second heart sound may be loud and single if there's really quite significant pulmonary hypertension, otherwise it's usually normal. Uh, and there's a diastolic murmur at the apex. <clears throat> and this murmur has pre-systolic accentuation. Uh, what happens is as the atrial contraction occurs before the beginning of ventricular systole, uh, there's an increase in flow across the valve, and so this increase in flow uh, increases the intensity uh, of the murmur. So we <clears throat> often will hear presystolic accentuation of a diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis. Many infants with a fast heart rate, it's very hard to, to appreciate that, but in older children, uh, it's usually easily uh, detected. Interestingly, in congenital mitral stenosis, an opening snap is uncommon. We rarely hear an opening snap. That's almost always um, a finding of rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic mitral stenosis, but very rare uh, to hear an opening snap in congenital disease. The electrocardiogram often has left atrial abnormality, left atrial enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy may be part of it, again, because of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the chest x-ray is quite variable depending on the severity, of course, of mitral stenosis. You may see a relatively normal heart size or mild cardiac enlargement. Um, <clears throat> there's often pulmonary congestion and edema in more severe disease like this chest x-ray. This child had quite severe mitral stenosis. Uh, and you can see there's just florid pulmonary edema here with a uh, mild uh, increase in, in heart size. And sometimes you can see what's called vascular cephalization, that the, the vessels uh, in the upper uh, uh, lobes are, are more prominent uh, than in the lower lobes. Congenital mitral regurgitation has a bit of a more variable presentation. Um, <clears throat> the children with congenital mitral regurgitation may actually be quite uh, asymptomatic or uh, may present with, uh, with real uh, heart failure symptoms. So it, it, it's quite variable and not uh, completely dependent on the uh, amount of regurgitation. It isn't totally clear. Perhaps diastolic properties of the left ventricle are important here in determining symptomatology as well. Uh, usually there's a holosystolic murmur, a loud murmur at the apex, uh, often a blowing murmur, higher pitched. The electrocardiogram again shows left atrial abnormality, left atrial enlargement, but here we often see left ventricular hypertrophy or evidence of left ventricular volume overload. The chest x-ray usually shows some cardiac enlargement because this is a, a volume load lesion more than uh, what we would see in mitral stenosis. So there's usually cardiac enlargement in addition to the left atrial enlargement. Um, <clears throat> the mechanisms of dysfunction uh, of the valve are, are important to determine, for, of course, for surgical treatment. Uh, and, and we think about this uh, uh, by, again, breaking the valve down into its component parts, just like we would a heart uh, for analysis. Uh, and so we think about the annulus of the valve, the leaflets, cords, and papillary muscles. So we'll take these one at a time and, and think about them uh, a little bit and what the mechanisms are that affect, affect that area of the valve. 
So the annulus, we're interested in the size of the annulus and whether there is a supravalvar stenosing ring here. In this example, you can see there's a good size mitral annulus here. In this patient, the problem is the outlet of the valve. It's the egress from the mitral funnel here, not uh, the annulus uh, itself. So it's important to, to figure out if the annulus is normal size and then uh, if uh, the problem with the valve is lower down. Whereas in this heart, uh, the mitral annulus is quite small, commensurate with the size of this small left ventricle. So uh, again, small annulus, normal annulus size. Uh, <clears throat> This one, you can see again, we have a small annulus here. There's a stenosing ring at the annulus. Uh, here you can see the leaflets are sort of held together and there, there are little ridges that protrude out over the annulus on both sides. There's also a parachute valve. There's only the single papillary muscle here down in this left ventricle. So you can see the, the variation in annulus size that we can see. And of course, there are uh, plenty of publications that have um, normal ranges uh, based on body size or age uh, for mitral annulus size. And of course, it's important to consult uh, whatever standard you're using to figure out uh, the relative size of the mitral annulus compared to the, to the body size. Also at the uh, annular level, we can see a stenosing ring. Here you can see uh, in the specimen here in the middle of this ridge that projects out over the valve. And on the echocardiogram over here, you see the little ridge here behind the leaflets uh, right at the annulus protruding from below as well as from uh, the mitral to aortic fibrous continuity on the other side. And in an apical view, again, you can see the uh, stenosing ring projecting in over the mitral annulus, narrowing the inflow into the mitral valve. So this is a typical supramitral stenosing ring. And here's the same thing with 3D echo. Here you see the mitral valve, the funnel down here. It's a parachute. It's coming down to the single papillary muscle. But if we look right here at the annulus of the valve, you can see this little shelf uh, that protrudes uh, and narrows uh, the annulus of the valve, causing supravalvar stenosis. So now we can think about the leaflets. <clears throat> we want to know if there is uh, adequate tissue, if it's uh, normally formed, the mobility of the leaflets, uh, are the commissures open or closed, and then the orifice area that's uh, formed by the leaflets. And one of the uh, abnormalities of leaflets that we see is a cleft uh, in the middle uh, part of the anterior mitral leaflet. Here you can see on 3D echo, uh, the cleft here in the middle. This is the anterolateral, and this is the posterior medial papillary muscle. You can see the mural leaflet back here on the free wall, and this is all anterior leaflet running between the two papillary muscles. And in the middle of it, you see this little division or cleft. The leaflets thicken because there's a lot of uh, mitral regurgitation through the cleft. This is um, a regular echocardiogram showing a similar kind of cleft. Here you can see it in the anterior leaflet. Uh, the two edges are, are, are unattached, so they're not supported, and you can see how they prolapse back into the left atrium during systole, uh, and this is part of the mechanism that allows regurgitation through the cleft in the valve. But this short axis uh, view is really what's useful for seeing the cleft and also seeing the regurgitant jet going right through the cleft, as you can see here. So that's... Um, uh, how we would look at this. And here you can see the cleft here. This is the superior cushion component, inferior cushion component, the lateral leaflets back here on the free wall. This is anterolateral posterior medial papillary muscle. And you can see this cleft uh, in the medial leaflet with thickened edges and uh, due to regurgitation. Leaflet mobility uh, is another issue. You can see these leaflets uh, in this uh, apical view. Th these leaflets are quite thick and poorly mobile, particularly this posterior leaflet. And if you were at conference this morning, uh, you saw another patient who had essentially an immobile uh, posterior leaflet. Here you can see the thickening of the leaflets in a specimen here that result in this poor mobility uh, in, uh, in this case, stenosis of the valve. There's some regurgitation a little bit, but mostly this causes stenosis because the leaflets are too uh, dense and thick to move away from each other very well during 
diastole, and so uh, we have a narrowed orifice and, and an inflow gradient. We can also see this uh, in patients with uh, endomyocardial fibrosis. Here you can see a <clears throat> mitral valve with a dephasing jet here coming through the middle of it during diastole down into the ventricle. And the reason for this is because of endocardial fibrosis. You can see in this um, uh, delayed enhancement uh, image over here, this is the, the mitral funnel here. This is down into the left ventricle. And you can see the uh, papillary muscles here and the cords are completely coated with this fibrous material uh, resulting in thickening and poor mobility of the leaflets like we see over here in the Sine uh, MRI. The orifice then uh, becomes narrow. You can see here uh, that the leaflets are, are tethered, they're, they're thick, they, they don't move very well, and so that results in a small orifice that you can see over here also on the apical view, uh, and that's what in this case produces the stenosis. It's, it's the outlet uh, of the mitral funnel that's narrowed here because of leaflet thickening and uh, immobility uh, and uh, short cords, and that's what causes the, the gradient. We can also see uh, leaflets that are um, <clears throat> attached to each other to form a double orifice valve. So here you see in the short axis view, there's an orifice here aimed at the anterolateral muscle and another orifice here aimed at the posterior medial muscle. Uh, so this is a double orifice. Uh, this is the most common type of double orifice that we see here. You see the same thing in an apical view, one orifice here one orifice here, and there's a little bridge of tissue here at the annulus level uh, between the two leaflets that divides uh, the mitral orifice into two separate little funnels coming down. It's sort of like two parachutes. Each of these goes to uh, its own papillary muscle, the anterolateral and the posterior medial. Double orifice mitral valve, fortunately, it turns out, uh, usually doesn't need um, a lot of treatment. Most of the time it occurs with associated defects, although sometimes it can be isolated. The one I showed you just now was isolated, but many of these patients have other things, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, coarctation, ventricular septal defect, uh, things like that. Of these, uh, this was a report uh, um, uh, almost 20 years ago now, but it's about the largest one I know of on double orifice. Um, of them, most of them had undergone surgery, but for other reasons, for the associated defects. Only six of them had uh, mitral valve reconstruction, uh, six out of the 46. Uh, <clears throat> and with follow-up of uh, up to 20 years, there were no deaths and only one mitral valve replacement. So the majority of double orifice valves function okay uh, and don't need anything done about them. It's usually when it's associated with AV canal defects that we really get into trouble when we see a double orifice mitral valve. Then if we go down uh, to the cord level, uh, the length of the cords can be important, a fusion and matting of the cords, fusion together, and then attachments where the cords uh, actually attach. So here's an example of a patient with mitral regurgitation because of short tethering cords. If you look down here near the posterior medial muscle, uh, you can see that there are cords here running from this posterior leaflet back to the free wall. Uh, and these keep this part of the leaflet from moving out toward the uh, medial leaflet. And so we have a large regurgitant orifice back here uh, in the area of the posterior medial commissure. Uh, and you can see over here on the specimen, uh, <clears throat> here are the cords that are short back here. Here's the posterior leaflet. Here's the anterior leaflet up here. And you can see that in this corner back here, uh, these sh cords are quite short uh, and uh, don't allow the, the valve itself to move away to meet uh, the anterior leaflet. And so that results in a, in a uh, regurgitant orifice back here in this area where the cords are short. Sometimes these can be divided uh, uh, to increase the mobility of the valve if they're secondary cords. If they're primary or edge cords, uh, then this can result in regurgitation. And sometimes then you have to uh, either uh, remove a part of the leaflet if, if the valve is big enough or, or resuspend uh, the leaflet from uh, another part of the leaflet and, and divide some of the tethering uh, cords. Uh, 
short cords uh, we also see sometimes uh, connecting to the regular papillary muscles here you can see in this case uh, the leaflets come down very close to the papillary muscle they're just some short cords sort of like you see over here in the specimen here these little short cords the leaflets coming right down to the papillary muscles and if we look at that with color flow you can see that there are just little intercordal spaces uh, where the blood flow comes through uh, so it would be coming through these little intercordal spaces because uh, the leaflet ends right on the papillary muscle, uh, obliterating much of the primary orifice, so you only have these little areas of secondary orifice for blood to get through the valve. And then we can have uh, basically absent cords where the leaflets come right down and, and basically attach right onto the papillary muscles, a so-called uh, arcade type of valve. <clears throat> and there you don't see any uh, secondary cord uh, egress, you only see the small primary orifice here in the middle. If it's a, a, a stenotic valve, more often these are regurgitant, and so you get a big regurgitation jet uh, because of this immobile anterior leaflet that uh, connects directly to the cords. And the reason that Dr. Jesse Edwards called this a, an arcade valve is that it looks like uh, an arcade, an architectural feature on a building, which is a a walkway, usually alongside the building, that has an arched roof supported by columns. Uh, and so the uh, free edge of the anterior mitral leaflet looks like the arch at the top, and then the two papillary muscles look like the columns on either side. And this reminded Dr. Edwards of an arcade. And so he called this type of mitral valve deformity an arcade type of valve. Parachute valves uh, indicate that the chordal attachments are to a single papillary muscle or to a group of very closely spaced papillary muscles so that the problem here is egress from the valve. Here you can see this big papillary muscle here on the free wall with all the leaflets coning down to it and just the orifice here aimed right at the papillary muscle. And you can see the same thing in this 3D echo over here. Here's the, here are the leaflets and you can see they come down to the single papillary muscle with a small orifice there. Uh, near the head of the papillary muscle. That's uh, one type of uh, parachute, a sort of funnel type, where there's usually a good size orifice and then the valve funnels down to the outlet uh, at the single papillary muscle. But we can also see a more tubular kind of valve, sort of like what you see here in the middle. Uh, and this echocardiogram shows that kind of tubular valve. The annulus is quite small uh, and then the leaflets tend to be very long and extend down into the left ventricle. So here you can see this long tubular shape of a parachute uh, valve uh, as it goes down into the left ventricle with a small annulus. And then in short axis, you can see that the orifice is here just at the posterior medial. There's nothing going to this uh, anterolateral, no, no cords going to that. All of the orifice and cords center around this posterior medial muscle. And you can see the same thing here in an apical view. You see how this uh, is a long tubular valve that comes down into the ventricle. So this type of parachute is much more difficult to, to deal with because the whole valve is quite small. So it, uh, if it needs something done, it, uh, it's much more difficult. Then uh, the other feature of the valve, the other component of the valve really are the papillary muscles and we want to evaluate the papillary muscles. Often they're the culprit here. Here you can see they're very thick hypertrophied papillary muscles that are very close together forming a dense base for this valve, dense outlet. And all the cords are matted and fused together. The leaflets come right down to the papillary muscles and so uh, <clears throat> the primary orifice here is largely obliterated and only things like this commissure here, which we can see on the side of the valve. This is the posterior leaflet. This is the anterior leaflet. They come down on top of the papillary muscles. Uh, and it, it looks a lot like this. Here you can see these dense papillary muscles here down in the ventricle and the valve leaflets come both the posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflet come down to the single papillary muscle base here. And this is what uh, Dr. Carpentier, uh, Elaine Carpentier, has called a hammock valve. Uh, you can see the sort of hammock shape uh, of the valve. Uh, so this is a, a hammock type of valve where both the posterior and anterior leaflet come down to the same uh, 
dense group of papillary muscles here so that the primary orifice is largely obliterated and we just have small intercortal spaces or small commissures uh, uh, for egress. And then we can see basal displacement of papillary muscles. Look at this papillary muscle here. Uh, it's all the way up at the annulus of the valve rather than being down in the ventricle. And you can see how this interferes with uh, mobility of the posterior leaflet. The posterior leaflet here is thick. It, it just doesn't move at all because it's buttressed really by this uh, basally displaced papillary muscle. And so you get poor leaflet motion and uh, usually some mitral stenosis. This can also result in regurgitation uh, because it keeps the leaflets uh, from closing. But in this case, the valve was mostly stenotic. So <clears throat> This is a, a way to think about congenital mitral valve disorders. Uh, there's a quite variable anatomy. Uh, th these valves are often complex, and so we need a very systematic approach like this of looking at all the components of the valve to figure out where the problem or problems are uh, so that the surgeons know what to fix. Any questions about um, the mitral valve or this approach? Okay, our treatment uh, for this, uh, there are a couple of ways that one can go about this. One is balloon dilation. Uh, these are data that uh, Doc McElhaney uh, uh, reported when he was here uh, on balloon dilation of the valve. Uh, and this is uh, outcome. Survival uh, is uh, at 10 years was about 80% here. Uh, and you can see that only about half of patients were free from uh, uh, mitral valve replacement and uh, fewer than 40 percent were free from a repeat mitral intervention at 10 years. So <clears throat> the results um, um, are often not very lasting. The, these uh, may need uh, either replacement or uh, another go at uh, repairing the valve. Uh, the pro problem here with this was that moderate or more mitral regurgitation occurred in 28% of the patients that they balloon dilated. Uh, I don't know if this is still the case, uh, but this is, uh, this is concerning because uh, patients with mitral stenosis and sometimes uh, somewhat small uh, left ventricle, sometimes with some fibroelastosis, don't tolerate a volume load very well. So the fact that you would get significant mitral regurgitation is potentially a problem with this approach. This doesn't work for things like parachute valves. Uh, of course, it's not uh, a reasonable approach for a supramitral ring that can be dealt with surgically with, uh, with very good results. Um, surgical mitral valve plasty, <clears throat> this was, these were comparison groups, but they weren't really comparable because obviously uh, the patients who went to surgery probably had a more favorable uh, anatomy because uh, uh, they were selected uh, for, for surgery. The survival is not a lot different here. It's probably 85 to 90% as opposed to about 80% over here. Uh, but the need for mitral valve replacement was uh, somewhat less here, about uh, only about 30%, about 70%, 75% were free from mitral valve replacement. But even these patients uh, uh, at 10 years, uh, about half of them uh, had uh, repeat uh, intervention. And clearly, the earlier, the younger uh, the patient is uh, at the time of the initial uh, need for treatment, uh, the worse uh, the outcome. And this is just a marker for severity of disease. It's, uh, um, we know that patients who uh, need an intervention earlier because of symptoms, fa failure to grow, et cetera, uh, are, have much worse anatomy generally and have, have worse outcomes than patients who don't need anything done. Uh, until a little bit later in life. This was another uh, report uh, on surgical repair. Uh, and here you can see the preoperative uh, uh, mean uh, gradient, which uh, decreased significantly intraoperatively, uh, was similar at discharge uh, and uh, midterm results. This was about two years uh, afterward, a year and a half, two years. Um, there was a slight increase in uh, mitral stenosis, but not, uh, not a, a great deal, certainly not back to, to where the pre-surgical levels were in the great majority of patients. There were a few who had uh, 
return to essentially pre-surgical uh, levels, but this was uh, clearly the minority of patients. Parachute valves, fortunately, uh, uh, only about 20% uh, or so end up really needing anything done about them, and that's probably a good thing because this is not an easy uh, lesion to treat. Uh, there, there's really not a lot to do with parachute valves except try to either split the papillary muscle and separate it uh, a bit. This often doesn't work all that well. Uh, sometimes one can try to fenestrate the, the leaflets if there are uh, reduced intercortical spaces to create more intercortical spaces to allow blood, allow egress for blood uh, from secondary orifice area as opposed to primary. But um, the surgical uh, results uh, are, 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 were not, uh, not terrific with the uh, parachute mitral valve. And fortunately, most patients, probably 75% or more, uh, don't really need anything done about the parachute valve. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the uh, tricuspid valve. It's much less of a culprit uh, in most of our patients than the mitral valve. Uh, tricuspid stenosis is quite uncommon in isolation. We, we just almost never see this. It's usually associated with some RV hypoplasia. Uh, this may be associated with Epstein's anomaly. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, but we do see uh, tricuspid valve abnormalities in patients with pulmonary septum, with uh, some few patients with transposition and some RV hypoplasia. And sometimes in supero-inferior ventricles, we can see quite a small uh, tricuspid valve. But here's a typical pulmonary atresia and tach septum patient. You can see this small, very hypertrophied right ventricle. And you see this tricuspid valve, uh, which looks a little bit like a parachute valve. You can see how it centers on this one papillary muscle group, the, the anterior papillary muscle group. And you can see the annulus here is not so bad, but the outlet from this valve. Here you can see in short axis, again, this big anterior papillary muscle, and all of the leaflets and cords really come down to, to that. Um, so you can see a parachute-like deformity of the valve uh, in some patients with pulmonary atresia and tach septum. And in patients with transposition, occasionally we see patients with a small right ventricle. Here you can see in the short axis view, you get a sense that this right ventricle is actually pretty small. Uh, and the tricuspid valve then is uh, small. The annulus may be a bit small. Uh, and these patients sometimes have uh, pericardial effusions, uh, pleural effusions after an arterial switch operation because the right ventricle here uh, uh, can't really handle a, a full cardiac output. So uh, th that's a look at some uh, AV valve abnormalities. Let's go and look at some anatomy uh, of some of these valves. This heart is from an older child with a cleft, an isolated cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet. Opening the left ventricle shows the mitral valve here, anterior leaflet, and the posterior leaflet here on the left ventricular free wall. The cleft is the space here between the two edges, the two parts of the anterior mitral leaflet. The superior endocardial cushion component is here in continuity with the aortic valve, and the inferior cushion component is here, attaching only to the posteromedial papillary muscle. The edges of the valve leaflets are very thickened and rolled because of severe mitral regurgitation. The left atrium is markedly dilated from the regurgitation, and viewing the cleft from the atrial side, again, shows the defect here in the anterior leaflet, clearly explaining the severe mitral insufficiency. This is the surgical view uh, that the surgeon would use to repair the defect by suturing the edges together like this to create an intact anterior mitral leaflet. This is an isolated cleft and not related to an endocardial cushion or AV canal defect. Uh, opening the right atrium here, we see that the atrial septum adjacent to the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve is completely intact with no primum atrial septal defect. <laughs> 
This heart is from an infant with an arcade type of mitral valve causing severe mitral insufficiency. Opening the left ventricle shows the interventricular septum and free wall. The two papillary muscles, the anterolateral here, posterior medial here, are on the left ventricular free wall. Notice that there is a, a fibrous ridge at the free edge of the anterior mitral leaflet that spans between the two papillary muscles. This is characteristic of an arcade type of valve. It's called an arcade because it resembles the architectural feature on the side of buildings with an arch for a roof supported by two columns on either side. So this is a typical arcade valve. Notice the posterior leaflet back here, but also between the two papillary muscles with very thick uh, free edge uh, cannot coapt with the anterior leaflet so that uh, there was a very large central regurgitant orifice. The left atrium uh, in this patient is markedly dilated, uh, consistent with severe mitral insufficiency. This heart this heart is from a child with severe mitral insufficiency. The left ventricle is markedly dilated. We see the septal surface and the free wall papillary muscles with the anterior mitral leaflet here and posterior or mural mitral leaflet here. The cause of regurgitation in this case is tethering of the posterior leaflet. Notice the short cords here attaching the posterior leaflet to the free wall. The leaflet simply cannot move away from the free wall. Even as we go further over, there are very short secondary cords here that uh, also attach the posterior leaflet to the free wall so that it can't reach the anterior leaflet and coapt normally. This would leave a large regurgitant orifice, particularly in this corner of the valve, uh, where there are many short chordal attachments onto the free wall. That uh, produced severe insufficiency, which caused dilation of the left ventricle, as well as marked dilation of the left atrium. This heart is from a child with congenital mitral stenosis due to a supravalvar ring. Opening the left ventricle shows the anterior mitral leaflet here and parts of the posterior leaflet here on the, on the free wall. If we look up through the mitral funnel, we can see the ridge of tissue here above the valve at the superior aspect of the valve annulus uh, that extends into the lumen of the valve annulus and causes supravalvar stenosis. Looking at this from the left atrial side, we see that the left atrium is markedly dilated. The ridge is here. And if we put this back together, you get a sense of the ring that's caused by the ridge here above the annulus of the valve causing severe supravalvar mitral stenosis. The ring can generally be resected with good result. This heart is from an infant with congenital mitral stenosis due to a parachute mitral valve. Opening the left ventricle shows the septal surface and the free wall with this single large papillary muscle that receives all of the insertions of the mitral valve. This is the orifice in the valve, its primary means of egress from the valve. When we view this opened, this uh, edge has been cut here so that we can see into the valve. Uh, you can see that there is marked redundancy and thickening of the leaflets. In addition to the funnel shape of the valve, large at the annulus, but coning down to a very small outlet on top of this single papillary muscle. So this is a funnel shaped type of parachute mitral valve resulting in 
significant mitral stenosis. In this example of parachute mitral valve, all of the cordae except for this one tiny one attach to the posteromedial papillary muscle. Here we see the cords converging on the posteromedial muscle. This is typical of a parachute mitral valve. This is actually a slight variant on parachute mitral where we do have the one cord going to the uh, anterolateral papillary muscle, but you can see that basically all of the leaflets and the rest of the cord center around this posteromedial group, uh, again, limiting the size of the uh, outlet uh, from this valve. This heart is from an older child with typical congenital mitral stenosis, as uh, has been named by Dr. Richard von Prague. Opening the left ventricle shows the septum here, left ventricular outflow, and the mitral apparatus with free wall papillary muscles. Notice that the papillary muscles are quite large and hypertrophied and very close together, so that there is almost no space on the free wall between these hypertrophied papillary muscles. This results in obliteration of the primary orifice of the valve uh, out through the edges of the leaflets. Raising this papillary muscle shows the posterior leaflet in the back and how it attaches to the same papillary muscles. The only egress from this valve is secondary orifice area like uh, this anterolateral commissure that we see here between the posterior leaflet and anterior leaflet of the valve. The cords are thickened uh, and fused together and densely attached onto the tops of the papillary muscles, uh, again obliterating the primary orifice area and largely occluding any potential intercordal spaces except for commissures. So this is a type of congenital mitral stenosis with cordal fusion and thickening hypertrophied papillary muscles that obliterate the primary orifice area of the valve uh, and force blood through small secondary orifices in the valve, either at commissures or through small intercord. So this is uh, the kind of valve that uh, Carpentier called a hammock type of valve. You can see, get a sense of the hammock uh, appearance here of the valve. If you looked at it from above, it's, uh, it's probably even more apparent. This is an example of double orifice mitral valve. Here we see the larger posterior orifice inserting onto the posterior medial papillary muscle, the smaller anterior orifice here inserting onto the anterior papillary muscle. Between these two orifices, there's a division that extends all the way back to the level of the annulus. From the left atrial side, we see this bridge or division between the two orifices of the valve at the annulus level. With the smaller orifice on one side and the larger orifice on the other. This happens to be uh, an un unbalanced or unevenly divided mitral valve. Very often the two orifices are, are actually the same size, but Sometimes we see this uh, type of double orifice valve where one orifice is quite a bit larger than the other. This is one type of double orifice valve uh, where there is a bridge uh, that uh, is really at the annular level that really divides the annulus and the whole valve apparatus into the two parts. We'll see uh, <clears throat> when we talk about the tricuspid valve, uh, an example of uh, a little different type of double orifice where one orifice is within one of the leaflets of the valve. This is an example. So these are uh, some examples of uh, some left heart valve uh, pathology. Um, and let's just look uh, at some uh, issues that we can see in the right heart as well.
we talked a little bit about this. This heart is from an infant with pulmonary atresia with intact interventricular septum. In this condition, the right ventricle is often hypoplastic and very hypertrophied, and the tricuspid valve can be dysplastic and regurgitant. We're looking at this tricuspid valve from the right ventricular side. This is the septal leaflet, the inferior leaflet, and the anterior leaflet of the valve. Notice that the leaflets are quite thickened with rolled edges and short fibrotic cords which attach the leaflets closely to the free wall underneath. This prevents the leaflets from moving away from the wall toward each other and coapting normally. This leaves a large regurgitant orifice in the middle of the valve resulting in quite significant tricuspid insufficiency. This patient had had a procedure to open the pulmonary outflow tract. Here we see a patch of pericardium that's been placed in the outflow tract uh, to open the pulmonary valve out to the pulmonary artery. So this is typical tricuspid valve pathology in patients with quite significant tricuspid regurgitation uh, in association with pulmonary atresia and intact ventricular septum. We saw before. This heart was explanted from a teenager with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Opening the right ventricle shows the tricuspid valve. There are, in this case, predominantly two leaflets, the septal leaflet and an anterior leaflet. There appears to be only a small inferior leaflet. One of the weaknesses or points of vulnerability of the tricuspid valve is the commissure between the anterior leaflet and the septal leaflet. At other commissures, for example here at the posterior papillary muscle, we see chordae from both leaflets inserting into the same papillary muscle, thus pulling the leaflets together and enhancing coaptation of the valve at the commissure. However, at the septal anterior commissure, the two leaflets do not share a papillary muscle. The anterior leaflet typically inserts onto the medial papillary muscle or the papillary muscle of the conus, while the septal leaflet inserts onto multiple direct small papillary muscles on the septal surface. This does not help closure of the valve at this commissure. In fact, it allows it to spring apart as the annulus dilates with dilation of the ventricle. Therefore, the closure of the leaflet here becomes compromised and we often see regurgitation through this portion of the tricuspid valve in a systemic right ventricle. This is not peculiar to hypoplastic left heart syndrome, uh, but is characteristic of the tricuspid valve in general. And, and this is one of the weaknesses of the tricuspid valve as a systemic AV valve. This explanted heart from an infant with hypoplastic left heart syndrome illustrates the type of commissure plasty that's often done of the septal anterior commissure. Opening the right ventricle shows the anterior leaflet and septal leaflets as well as the inferior leaflet of this tricuspid valve. We see the blue suture here at the commissure between the anterior and septal leaflets indicating that these leaflets have been sewn together as part of the commissure plasty. This prevents separation of this portion of the valve and treats the regurgitation through the septal anterior commissure. So this is a commissure plasty that's often done as part of a tricuspid valve plasty for regurgitation. This heart was explanted from an infant with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Opening the right ventricle shows the tricuspid valve with anterior leaflet, inferior leaflet, and septal leaflets.
In this case, the septal leaflet has very long chordae tendineae that permit it to prolapse back into the atrium during systole. It slides past the anterior leaflet and back into the atrium, causing regurgitation. This is one of the causes of tricuspid regurgitation in patients with a systemic right ventricle. This heart was explanted from a teenager with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and a failing Fontan circulation. Here we see the tricuspid valve with the septal leaflet, inferior leaflet, and anterior leaflet. If we put the annulus together, we can see the primary orifice of this valve. Notice that the valve also has a second orifice here. This is a double orifice tricuspid valve. This orifice is within the leaflet, actually in the commissure, between the inferior and uh, superior or anterior leaflets of the tricuspid valve. You see that the secondary orifice has its own chordal attachments, its own papillary muscles on the wall. But often these secondary orifices within a leaflet do not coapt normally, and this is a site of regurgitation. This is a relatively uncommon anomaly of an AV valve, but when it does occur, it can be a difficult to detect cause of regurgitation. This is a So these are uh, some other examples of tricuspid regurgitation. The, this is the, the last one was the uh, other form of double orifice valve that I was mentioning earlier when we looked at the uh, mitral valve with the double orifice. This is one where the second orifice is within a leaflet. And this can be pretty difficult to detect by uh, echocardiography. One really has to be aware of this as a possibility. So if you see what looks like uh, flow going through a leaflet, um, think about uh, the possibility of a second orifice within the leaflet, because often these don't coapt normally, and so you can get uh, regurgitation there, particularly as the ventricle uh, begins to dilate. So these are um, some of the uh, mechanisms for regurgitation and stenosis that we see in the mitral and tricuspid valves and a way of thinking about the valve, a way of analyzing the valve, thinking about the annulus, the leaflets, the cords, and then the papillary muscle attachments. Uh, and uh, analyzing each of these separately uh, gives us a much more complete uh, picture of the valve anatomy and what may be causing the valve dysfunction uh, and therefore uh, direct the surgeons to uh, the correct type of repair for the valve. So that's uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today. Does anybody have any questions or